Alrighty, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, my name is Keir Johnson Reyes. I'm an Osage Nation tribal member, and I'm grateful to be working uh, for the Intertribal Agriculture Council as the Technical Assistance Specialist for California and Nevada, which is the IEC Pacific region. Um, very, very appreciative of this session here and that we are able to highlight uh, Ms. Uh, Linda Black Oak. Uh, before we get uh, rolling into the formal presentation, I just wanna uh, share a big thank you from all of us at IEC to the uh, conference sponsors. Uh, this session will be sponsored by our Champions of Agriculture, of Native Agriculture sponsors, as well as the University of Arizona Native Nations Institute on behalf of the Harvard Project and NNI. So Linda Black Elk uh, is an ethnobotanist and food sovereignty activist who works at United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck, North Dakota. And we are so grateful for uh, for your presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us, Linda, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. And um, I'm really honored to be on here talking about some stuff that I just think is super cool and a lot of fun. Um, when I was making this presentation and thinking about what, in, what to put in it, I was, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to talk about things that I find super uh, amazing. Um, I am uh, trained as a Western scientist, um, but I do consider myself an indigenous scientist um, first and foremost. And so I love talking about the science behind um, what we eat and why we eat it and how we harvest it and how we grow it. Um, you know, those I think are fantastic stories. And so I'm going to tell you guys a few of those stories today. So um, as Kier said, I'm Linda Black Elk. I'm the food sovereignty skills um, educator at United Tribes Technical College, which is of course the tribal college up here in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I want to say that I'm on the traditional lands of the Ocheti Shakoi, um, who are of course the Lakota, Dakota and Nakota peoples. And this is also the traditional homelands of the Nueta, Hidatsa and Sanish peoples. And I'm so um, happy and proud to be living and working and teaching on, on their homelands. Um, my kids are, uh, and my husband are enrolled members of the Cheyenne River and Stan Indian Rock Nations, and so I want to honor them today as well. So I'm here to just tell you some stories about the science of indigenous foodways. Um, we, uh, you know, and that goes, of course, I talk as an ethnobotanist, I talk about plants a lot, but I'll be talking about um, other things today too, uh, just because the science behind certain types of hunting and foraging um, are, are also really interesting. So, um, and when I, when I talk about science, you know, I mean, we could get bogged down discussing definitions all day, um, but you know, science is not a new thing, right? Indigenous people are the first scientists of this land. Um, you know, our ancestors know um, and have always known exactly the right way to live, the right kind of home to build, um, and uh, how to sustainably grow, harvest, um, uh, hunt, everything. So uh, yeah, these are some of those stories. And of course, I'm going to talk about some plants specifically and the um, story behind them, uh, but I'll also be talking about some other um, methodologies that um, deal with food and food sovereignty. So the first story that I love to talk about, and um, you know, this will be familiar to a lot of folks on here, anyone who uh, lives um, or is from the prairies uh, of North America is probably somewhat familiar with prairie turnips in English or Timsila in Lakota, Timsina in Dakota. Um, if you're interested in scientific names, you know, I, I use those a lot, Pediomelum esculentum. This is actually a member of the uh, legume family, the Fabiaceae family. Uh, so it is a bean, but um, this is not grown, uh, this is not um, harvested for any type of bean. It's actually harvested for the tubers, the roots that grow on the bottom. And you can see um, a lovely picture of some of the freshly harvested roots there on the bottom left. Um, and those um, actually still have the tap roots attached to them. 
And um, as you can see in the top right photo, we've taken those tap, we've, we've peeled these tipsila, you take off that brown sort of bark, and then um, you use those tap roots to braid them together to create a beautiful braid. Actually, you can see that I have quite a few of them hung up here behind me as well, because they're an important part of our diet. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating actually to me, the science behind the way these are harvested. Um, you know, it's, it's taken, uh, I'm, I'm sure that it took a long time for the indigenous people of the prairies, you know, more, not just the Lakota and Dakota, um, but of course, you know, other tribes on the prairies have um, been harvesting these for uh, millennia. And um, there are a couple of different harvesting methods, okay? So some people will actually um, take the, the team sila will be growing and um, they'll take their shovel, dig up the plant and pull the tuber off of the plant. And then they'll stand the plant back up in the hole, right? Almost exactly as if they had never been there. So they'll stand the plant back up put some dirt around it and the plant, it'll almost look like um, it had never been harvested and it'll be standing there without any root attached to the bottom. Um, and actually what happens, we've, we've done some research on this, monitoring this, what happens is, as you can see in the top left-hand photo, that's basically the perfect stage at which you harvest this plant after it's already flowering. And what will happen is after you take the tuber off the plant, um, and, and place the plant back up, standing back up, um, those, those seeds will still go to maturity. They will still actually mature, even without the tuber on the bottom. They'll dry up and they'll mature. And then what will happen is that the plant will dry up and it'll fall over and roll away. This is basically the only native tumbleweed of the, of the prairies. And it'll, uh, you know, roll, uh, break, like fall over and roll away and disperse its seeds through that rolling. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, now there actually is another harvesting method and it just varies from family to family. Um, but another way that a lot of people do it is they'll um, pull the tuber off the bottom and then instead of standing the plant back up, they'll actually turn it upside down and then cover it with dirt almost as if they're replanting the, the flowers, as if they're replanting it. And we actually found, so I've had students who've done research on this, both at United Triumphs and um, Sitting Bull College, where I, I taught for a very long time. And um, we've actually found that both methods result in a lot of awesome germination the next season. Uh, so when you turn it um, over and, and you cover it with dirt, you're basically replanting the, the flower heads and those seeds will still mature even underground and they'll, they'll germinate and uh, grow new plants. Um, you know, it, it, I, I've talked to a lot of different people about this like which way is better, you know? Like you guys know how it is on the res, it becomes this like, oh, well, my family taught me this way. And other people are like, well, you're wrong. My family taught me this way. Um, <laughs> but what we found is that actually both methods are super important and effective. Um, and even, um, you know, it, it's important to have that diversity of harvesting methodology because um, sometimes in the winter months when there's tons of snow, the seeds uh, from the rolling, um, the seeds that are left on top of the ground actually uh, freeze and um, freeze in not a good way. They'll over freeze. <laughs> if it's a really, really cold, snowy winter, um, they'll freeze and they won't germinate as, as readily. Whereas in, in those times, um, the ones that have been planted uh, in the ground turned upside down will actually have a higher germination rate. In warmer years, um, and years that are drier, uh, the ones that have been left standing up and then roll away actually have a higher germination rate. So it's a fantastic, you know, I mean, can, can you imagine all of the wonderful observation um, that came along with those two harvesting methods over time? Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the science behind food caching. And um, these are just some representations, and, and I think not very good representations of caches. 
Um, we have actually cached food before, uh, but it's very difficult to get a picture, <laughs> right? Because you kind of need that side view um, and, and you can't really get a good picture. It just looks like a, a bunch of corn basically in the ground when you um, take a photo from the top. So this is, you know, not a great representation, but, but you know, a representation nonetheless uh, uh, of what um, a food cache looks like. So um, as you can see from the diagram in the middle, um, they're actually a, a bit more involved than what people think. This is so much more than just digging a hole and putting food into the hole. You know, you have to think about what is going to be on the outside, um, you know, to maintain the structural integrity of the cache. Uh, and, and oftentimes that's corn still on the cob, you know, as a sort of um, as a sort of structure or beam system for the cache. And then squash and other things are placed um, in the center of the cache. And, and the reason for that, you know, no matter uh, what it is, the reason for that varies from tribe to tribe or, or from elder to elder, depending on who you talk to. But um, a lot of people say that the mice actually like the squash more than the beans and, and more than the corn. So you're kind of protecting the squash by placing it in the middle because it's sweet and all kinds of critters like it. Um, what they don't show on here is that there's actually an entire um, uh, subset of plants that are used specifically to line caches. So for, for example, um, uh, rodents tend to not like mint right? They don't like the smell. So often caches would be lined with mint. Um, uh, they also don't like the smell of a plant called fetid marigold. And it is a type of marigold. If you've ever grown marigolds in your garden, you know they have a very strong odor. And it's kind of a personal preference thing. Some people really like marigolds in their smell, and some people don't like them at all. But rodents definitely don't like marigolds. So that's another thing that was used to line caches um, so to, you know, so that you could keep the critters out. So there's, you know, a, a real incredible science behind food caches. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it actually helps to preserve the food for a very long time because of the cool temperatures under the ground. So fantastic method of food, food storage. Um, so one of my favorite stories to talk about um, is the buffalo berry and how that is harvested. Um, if you've ever eaten a buffalo berry, oh, let me say this. If you've never eaten a buffalo berry, it should be sort of like on your bucket list, okay? Because they are so freaking delicious and they have a flavor unlike any other berry ever, right, that I've ever had. And, and I, you know, it's hard to describe. Um, they're very high in lycopene, uh, like tomatoes are as well. So they're actually really good uh, for, for men and, and for prostate health. But um, that also, that, that lycopene gives them a particular flavor. Um, it, it, they don't taste like tomatoes. I don't, I don't want you to think that. But it does give them a, a sort of um, fruity uh, sweetness. And so, I, I don't know, you know, when I describe the way that buffalo berries taste, all I can think of is red freshness, <laughs> you know, which is kind of a weird way to describe it, but um, they're, they're, you know, incredibly high in nutrients. And the reason I put that silly article um, in the bottom left hand of the screen is because um, in that magazine, the Daily Mail, and in a bunch of other um, publications, um, you know, back in uh, 2014, 2015, they actually declared buffalo berries the next superfood. And I hate the term superfood because it implies that like, you know, this is the end all be all. And then, uh, uh, you know, of foods. And then all of a sudden people started eating it. Do you guys remember the craze with acai berries? A-C-A-I, um, you know, blueberries were considered a superfood, broccoli was considered a superfood, and all of a sudden everyone was eating them. Um, you know, everything is a superfood. Um, everything traditional is a superfood. Obviously, Twinkies don't count, but, um, you know, these, uh, you know, all traditional foods are superfoods um, because they all provide a different kind of, of medicine, right? Food is medicine. And buffalo berries actually provide uh, a ton of nutrients. Um, now, one of the things I like about the science um, behind uh, collecting buffalo berries is that they are harvested um, after they freeze. 
So after the first freeze is when you actually go out and um, collect buffalo berries. Why is that? It's because they're sweeter. Have you ever taken some berries you've collected or maybe some uh, blueberries and put them in the freezer? Frozen blueberries taste much sweeter than fresh blueberries. And it's because uh, the freezing freezes the water in, in the berry and then the water evaporates off, thus leaving all the sugars more condensed. Right. So um, uh, there if you collect buffalo berries before the first frost, they're actually a lot more sour. Now, I don't mind that. I don't mind that sort of sour freshness, but it's definitely more difficult to collect them before they freeze as well. Um, they're attached pretty firmly to the branches, but after the first frost or after the first freeze, um, they kind of loosen up a little. Uh, so traditionally, the way to collect them would be to spread a tarp out on the ground and then shake the branches or hit the branches with something like a broom or, or a stick or something. And then the uh, berries will all fall off onto the tarp or hide, whatever you put underneath them, much more easily. I, um, I remember uh, an elder told me a story that he asked his sister to make him a buffalo berry pie because it was like his favorite thing to eat. And you can see why, right? That buffalo berry pie looks freaking delicious. Um, <laughs> uh, I kind of want that right now. But um, so he, uh, his sister said, okay, I'll make you a buffalo berry pie. And she handed him, you know, one of those old glass milk jugs. This was a long time ago. And she said, fill this with buffalo berries and I'll make you a buffalo berry pie. But she didn't tell him how to collect them. So he went out and when he came back, hours and hours later, his hands were all cut up. Um, you can't see in this photo, but um, buffalo berries actually have thorns on them, sort of thorny protrusions. Um, some people call them spurs. And um, if you try to hand pick the buffalo berries, you know, you'll sometimes get jabbed by those spurs. And he was only, I think, seven years old at the time. So this elder, his hands were just all cut up by the end of the day. Um, and then the next day, actually, too, she, you know, she did make him a buffalo berry pie, and he loved it, and he was happy, and it was worth it, you know, but his hands were super cut up and sore. But the very next morning, these two little old ladies came to the door, these little grandmas, and they said, oh, we saw you out picking buffalo berries tomorrow, and we really need your help to, to pick five gallons of buffalo berries today. And he was just looked down at his um, hands and he was like, oh my gosh, you know, but he couldn't say no to these little grandmas. Um, so he was like, oh, he was all ready to get his hands all messed up. And, um, he, you know, the way he tells the story is that he got out there and he was sitting in the car, you know, they got out to the buffalo berry spot and he was sitting in the car just dreading getting out there and picking buffalo berries all day. But then he noticed that the old ladies got into the trunk, got out a tarp and a broom, spread it out underneath the bushes, and then just hit the bushes a few times and bam, almost five gallons of buffalo berries just fall right down onto the ground. And he said he went home and he was really mad at his sister for not telling him the proper way to collect them. So um, so there you remember that, you know, sometimes that there are, right, indigenous people know the perfect way to harvest things um, uh, most efficiently. So. Um, another one of my uh, favorite fruits in the whole world are sand cherries. Sand cherries are closely related to choke cherries, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, but sand cherries actually grow down toward the ground, right? So they're um, like a shrub that actually creeps down close to the ground. They usually never get higher than maybe 12 inches tall. Um, but they produce huge cherries on them, much larger, sometimes four times larger than choke cherries. And in my opinion, they're a lot sweeter too. Um, and they get quite large, as you can see in the photo in the bottom right hand corner. Um, they get really large, almost the size of like a store bought bean cherry, you know. So it's sometimes it's a lot nicer to be harvesting them. Um, not only are they sweeter than choke cherries, but they're also a lot larger with a lot more fruit on them. Um, and, you know, like I said, they're absolutely bomb. <laughs> they're so, so good. Uyayapi is the um, Lakota and Dakota name. But sand cherries are really fascinating. Um, I remember when I first moved out to the Dakotas, um, an elder told me that you, um, when you uh, go out to harvest sand cherries, you have to approach them from downwind. Otherwise, they'll smell you coming and they'll turn bitter. Now, you know, I mean, I was like, 
uh, they'll smell me coming. I, th I kind of thought it was a figurative story, you know, or like there was some lesson to it. Um, but I didn't realize that it was actually a really incredible scientific concept. And so um, I, uh, I was actually working with a chemist from North Dakota State University. And I told him this story and he was like, well, let's figure that out. He was like, are you interested in that? Let's figure it out. And what we actually found through some various experiments is that um, the sand cherries uh, on the stems, and you can't really see them too well in these photos, but they have um, little dots. Uh, some people call them lenticels. Some people call them stomata. And these little dots actually are almost like breathing pores, right? They're almost like pores. And they'll open up and close and open and close, right? And they're, they're you know, of course they're taking in um, uh, what we breathe out and they're giving off oxygen, right? Um, but when they open up and take uh, in the carbon dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, <laughs> they'll, um, they'll actually also take in pheromones. And if they sense pheromones, if, if they smell pheromones, they'll start producing bitter alkaloids um, to prevent from getting, you know, uh, to prevent the berries from um, getting over harvested. So um, it's fascinating, right? Because, you know, if even if they uh, smell deer, right, they'll they'll start producing these bitter alkaloids. If they smell humans, they'll start producing these bitter alkaloids. So it's true. You want to approach them from downwind so that they don't smell you coming. Right. Isn't that fantastic? And of course, you know, I mean, I think it's amazing that, you know, um, it, uh, indigenous people of the prairies where this primarily grows have had such a long relationship with this plant um, that they've known like, oh, OK, you know, we have to approach you with respect from downwind. Um, otherwise, you're going to smell us coming. So <laughs> kind of like hunting. Right. Um, so, of course, nixtamalization. I think a lot of people on here are probably very familiar with the process of nixtamalization, um, which is basically, um, you know, nixtamalizing corn is, um, there, there's a number of ways to do it. A lot of people these days will boil corn in um, lye. Right. Um, traditionally, corn is boiled in wood ash. Um, so you get the ashes from a fire, some really good ash. Um, and, uh, you know, the finer it is, the more you break it up, the better. Um, boil the corn in there for a period of time and it becomes hominy, right? <laughs> now, why? Why would anyone want to do that? And, and actually, I've seen a lot of people these days um, eating, um, uh, instead of eating uh, hominy, they'll eat just dried corn without it being nixtamalized, right? The problem with that is, um, and I don't, I've never known how to say this delicately, but if you've ever eaten corn on the cob, you know that it just basically passes through your body. <laughs> it doesn't get completely digested. <laughs> Whereas when you eat hominy, um, it has been processed in such a way to break down the seed coat on the outside of the corn. And um, that makes uh, a lot of the nutrition in the corn much more bioavailable. Okay, so you are getting almost all of the nutrition after you nixtamalize corn, turn it into hominy, um, you break down that seed coat and it makes um, much more of the nutrients in that corn bioavailable. That means your body, can, your cells can use them, use that nutrition. Okay, so without that process, um, you're actually left without um, very much nutrition at all. It, it just passes through you. Um, oh, one of my favorite processes. These are actually all my photos. Um, <laughs> and you can see there on the left-hand side, um, we have cut up some bison. Uh, and, um, you know, we're not as good at it as some people. I, I recently saw a photo of a guy holding up a huge sheet of um, buffalo that he had cut thinly and it was just all one sheet of buffalo meat that he was getting ready to hang up to dry. Uh, we're not that good. Um, and actually some of that was done by my students at United Tribes. Um, but that's, you know, that's what we're doing. My, my husband built that rack there, that drying rack, and we just hung buffalo meat up to dry. 
And that is actually um, our dining room. That's our dining area. And, you know, I think a lot of people, I've, I've done workshops on this, I've done um, webinars, and people are always saying to me, well, you, you had to salt the meat, right? Or they're saying, well, you have to smoke the meat, right? Like you have to do this outside and you have to light a fire and like let the smoke get there. Otherwise the meat's gonna go bad. And it's absolutely not true. So you can see in my basket in the middle there, that's the dried meat um, from the, the, the rack on the left-hand side. And that only took three days, three days of just sitting on the rack um, in my dining room you know and and mind you i live in a very dry climate right north dakota south dakota it's very dry here there's a real lack of humidity um and so it it dries very quickly but air drying meat is um has been done for thousands and thousands of years um you know it's done in mongolia it's done in korea it's uh you know um uh, siberia um people have been air drying meat for a very long time and it doesn't require any salt any salting of the meat, um, and it doesn't require any sort of seasoning, and it doesn't require smoke. Um, and then, of course, on the right-hand side, that's a traditional Lakota soup called bapa soup, and you can actually see some of the cut-up timsila, the prairie turnips from earlier that are in there, um, along with some dried squash, um, of course, the dried meat, uh, and things like that. Um, oh, and the hominy, actually. Uh, so a lot of uh, what we talked about today is in that soup. Um, and, and dried meat gives soup a much different uh, flavor. And of course it has a much different texture than fresh. And that dried meat, you know, um, will last forever. You know, you can, you can actually keep that for years uh, like that. Um, and so because we tend to um, put dried meat into soups and things like that, or we tend to make what's called wasna, um, which is where you take um, shredded dried meat uh, and mix it with dried berries and fat um, to make a wasna, otherwise known as pemmican. Um, and so because it's used in those dishes, uh, people don't want it to be seasoned. Most people don't want it to be seasoned. I mean, you could if you wanted to put some, you know, smoke on there or put some uh, salt and things, but you don't have to, okay? I think that's the real point that air drying is enough. And, um, you know, it's, it's, there, it's such an amazing science to realize that um, air drying meat is absolutely a valid method of food preservation um, because we have been so inundated with information that if you leave meat out, it's gonna spoil. Right. And, and I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I've, I've met friends who, if you leave meat out, even for a couple of hours, they'll throw it away because <laughs> they're so afraid of it spoiling. Um, but, you know, as indigenous people, they have figured out the perfect method for air drying meat and the perfect thickness of the cut um, in order for it to air dry properly. Um, I was just talking about choke cherries um, as one of the components in wasna or pemmican. And on the right there, you can actually see um, some of my dried choke cherry patties. I actually have them right here. Um, dried choke cherry patties. Uh, so, so if you look at any field guide, it, I, it never ceases to amaze me. If you look at um, a lot of field guides to edible wild plants, they will actually say that choke cherries are poisonous. And I, I've always thought that that was so odd because choke cherries are um, a just like incredibly important food source for indigenous peoples throughout North America, right? Not just on the prairies. Um, there are is a certain species of choke cherries that grows out east, you know, all the way to the west and to the north and even down south. And um, it's processed pretty much the same way by almost all people who have access to choke cherries. And that is, as you can see, those dried choke cherry patties on the right, the pit is crushed with the cherry. The reason that field guides say that cherries are poisonous is because the pits do contain high amounts of cyanide, as all cherry pits do, right? Even the ones that you get from the store. Even plum pits contain, and peach pits contain uh, uh, levels of cyanide, right? So um, if that's true, then how is it and why is it that indigenous people eat the pits? Anybody? <laughs> um, normally, when I ask this question in my classes, my students will say something like, oh, well, we must have built up a resistance to cyanide. 
No. <laughs> no, we have not. <laughs> Please don't test that. <laughs> you don't have a resistance to cyanide. Okay. Um, what happens is, is that the acidity of the fruit juice, this is another research project that was done up at NDSU um, uh, with indigenous students. And um, what they found is that the um, acidity of the fruit juice breaks the bond between the cyanide and whatever it's attached to. I can't remember what it's attached to, but it dissipates. The cyanide actually dissipates as a gas. And all you're left with is the incredible nutrition from the pits. The pits actually contain tons of phytonutrients. They contain complex carbohydrates and they contain proteins. So if you talk to elders, elders that I've talked to will always say, you have to leave the pits in. You have to mash the pits up because that's where all the medicine is. It's actually totally true. Um, and if you've ever eaten choke cherries before, you know that the pit is huge and that the actual amount of fruit on the outside is, is, is small. It's a very small amount. The ratio is a very small amount of fruit to pit. And um, if you tried to take the time to take the fruit off uh, and throw the pits away, you're going to be really disappointed. It's going to take a ton of time and it's not efficient at all. Um, so why not crush the pits and eat them? Um, and, and actually, when you eat uh, dried choke cherry or, or um, as the case may be, uh, um, maybe you're making wojapi, which is, of course, where you take um, these dried choke cherry patties, reconstitute them in some hot water to make a pudding, right? That pudding is called wojapi. Um, it's delicious uh, because with the pits in there, it actually tastes like a combination of cherries, dark cherries, and almonds, right? So it's, it's wonderful to leave them in there flavor-wise, um, but it's also important to leave them in there um, for the nutrition, okay? Um, let's see here. Uh, so the last thing, um, that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, and then um, I'd like to answer some questions if that's all okay with you guys, is the science of spearing fish through the ice. It's one of my favorite activities. It's the most fun and in my opinion, meditative thing that you can do <laughs> for food acquisition. Um, and if you've never had the opportunity to spear fish, um, through the ice in particular. Uh, and, and, you know, guys, I could have talked about a million things today, but um, I wanted to talk about the things that I have the most fun with. Um, and so spearing fish through the ice, as you can see in that photo on the top right hand, you basically make a hole in the ice, just as if you were going ice fishing, but you use a decoy. Okay, and if you've never um, gone ice, uh, you know, spearing through the ice, maybe you don't know, uh, you can see on the left hand photo um, that that wooden decoy there with the fins um, and and the string, you can actually see the string in that photo. And basically you hold that string up at the top, you're looking down into the hole through the ice um, and you're jigging, right? You're pulling that um, that decoy up and down. And in that motion, if the decoy is built right, and believe me, some of my Anishinaabe friends are amazing um, uh, at making decoys. Um, and, uh, you know, so that they swim in a perfect circle. So you jig it and that wooden fish swims in a circle like this. And then the big uh, carnivorous, you know, predator fish will see your decoy and it'll become very intrigued and it'll try to go for it and eat your decoy. And at that moment, you have to be ready to send your spear down um, through the hole to spear, um, you know, maybe a big musky. Uh, some people don't like to eat musky, but it's delicious. Um, <laughs> and, uh, or like maybe a big Northern. And man, you can get some massively huge fish that way. Um, enough fish to feed a family for a couple of days, you know? Uh, so it's, it's an efficient, way um, and it's a really important way. Now there are very strict laws around spearing fish through the ice so make sure that if you're going to try this um, uh, you know check with um, check check about the laws in your area um, but it's you know a super fun family activity and uh, it's also a really good efficient way to get fish right. Um, so um, yeah, but it's also, you know, like if you are happen to be a science teacher and you want to teach physics, think about the physics of a fish decoy. And um, even, even, you know, about the physics of uh, the ratio of the size of the decoy to the size of the fish, things like that. So you can actually teach some really interesting mathematics um, and science using uh, spearing as an example.
So, okay, um, I think I might stop the share to answer questions. Um, I can always put uh, the photos and the PowerPoint back up if you all would like, uh, so that you can see maybe what the questions refer to. Um, but yeah, I'm super happy to take some questions right now. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, Linda. It's been so enjoyable. Uh, there's a list of questions, so I, I just want to frame it in that regard. We're going to try to get to as many as we possibly can within our time frame here. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started up right at the top. So a uh, question came in uh, really early on. Um, how long could a cache like uh, was displayed in your presentation last? So caches actually uh, weren't for super long term food storage. I mean, you know, unless you consider the winter months uh, to be long term and, and mind you, you know, so so like, uh, for example, if there was an earth lodge set up, oftentimes, uh, you know, like the Nueta, the Hidatsa, the Sanish, they would set up an earth lodge and there would be, you know, two or three caches inside the earth lodge. Um, and that would be what um, uh, the, you know, uh, the food for that family for the entire winter months, you know, which I mean, up here on the prairie, I, I don't know where the person asking the question is from, but up here on the prairie, the winter can last a long time, right? And, and we have a short growing season. So um, it has to last that last that long. But it's not like those caches. I mean, that food was being eaten every day um, by multiple, sometimes by multiple families, more than one, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it, it would just basically be lasting the winter. It wasn't for super long-term food storage. Thank you. Is buffalo berry also known as autumn olive? No, but they are in the same family, Iliagnaceae. Ili um, sorry to throw all that Latin out there, but um, <laughs> that they're related. So autumn an autumn olive can actually be used in a very similar way. It doesn't quite have the incredible nutrient value of uh, Schipertia argentea or the buffalo berry. Um, and, and there's another species of buffalo berry. So the one that I was showing is Schipertia canadensis, uh, I'm sorry, argentea, and the north Northern one that they make, you know, Indian ice cream out of uh, with the whipping, if any of you have ever had that, that's Schipertia canadensis. Um, so yeah, not, not the same thing, but related. Great. Uh, do the birds go for buffalo berries after a frost as well? You know, it's so crazy because my husband and I were just talking about that this year because it's, um, of course, December now and um, buffalo berries, you know, we were harvesting buffalo berries in like September, October um, because it, it snowed early this year, um, but they're still even right now, we could go out and get more buffalo berries. They're kind of dried, like almost like buffalo berry raisins on the shrubs all around us. Um, and so we ask ourselves all the time, why don't the birds eat those? Um, you know, I don't know if it's because they're high in um, saponic compounds, saponins, uh, which are the kind of detergenty, um, and you need to cook them, you know, or dry them to get that out. I'm not sure, but there's still a ton on the bushes, and so I don't see a lot of bird activity on them. Great question. Very interesting. Does grinding dry corn to flour without nixtamalization uh, allow for the nutrition to be bioavailable? It's, that's a great question. And I, uh, I've actually read a couple of papers on that. And I, uh, what I can tell you is no, it doesn't. And, but I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> so so, so I, I know the short answer to that question is no, the nutrients are not as bioavailable. There must be something about like the breakdown of the nutrients uh, by the ash um, or, you know, whatever compound you're using um, that, that just must change it on a cellular level maybe. I, I don't want to guess because I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, so I, but I can tell you um, that I've seen some before and afters of both and it, it doesn't. In the absence of salt, is there any form of fermentation going on with dried meat as a part of the preservation process? So I've always wondered that about meat. Um, and, and, you know, like, is, is the aging process, like when, when they age a, a side of beef, for example, um, is it fermenting? 
Um, I, I've never heard that it is, but I, am acid, I imagine that, you know, acids, enzymes are, are breaking it down in some way. Now, I, I want to say that when, uh, when we're talking about things like choke cherry patties, fermentation takes place. Fermentation takes place as it's drying, but also after it's reconstituted with water to make that pudding I was referring to called wojapi, um, the wojapi actually starts to ferment it almost immediately. Um, so, uh, you know, um, ferment fermented foods are actually traditional, um, and there's a lot of them, like maple vinegar up north, you know, uh, wojapi down this way, um, but I'm not sure if, if the meat ferments. That's a great question. I'll have to actually do some investigating on that. Is there only, uh, no, is the preservation process that you highlighted only useful for bison meat? Uh, what about other meats? any red meat. So we dry deer meat all the time. Um, we dry, we dry beef if we have it, um, some extra, we dry buffalo, um, elk, moose, you know, any of those uh, meats, never chicken or pork. <laughs> this is a, a, a question, um, uh, maybe either an existing or budding native chef uh, is asking it. I wonder if I can make uh, Nepal fruit tuna patties. Nepal, uh, <laughs> patties. Wait, which fruit? Uh, Nepal. So it would be the cactus fruit. Oh, Nepalis. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nepal fruit tuna patties. Oh, that sounds delicious. <laughs> no, Nepal fruits um, actually are also high in uh, lycopene and nutrients and easy to to keep around. <laughs> Great. Do you know of a plant identification field guide written by indigenous peoples. Oh gosh, <laughs> um, no. And, and you know, that's a real missing thing. So if you wanna write one, I highly encourage someone to do that. I, uh, so, so, okay, now that said, I actually wrote a field guide called Watoto Uyutapi, but it's a field guide to edible, just edible wild plants. I, I can't remember how many plants are in um, the field guide that I wrote, um, uh, and I wrote that at, you know, um, I was asked to write that by, uh, some of my friends from, um, Upper Sioux, and it has, like, 25 or 30 plants in there, and they have the Dakota names in there and information. That's great. Uh, so this person says, I missed it. Is there a process before eating pits or just letting them dry, or do they even need to dry? So talking about the choke cherries, I'm guessing. Yep, um, they do need to dry um, in order for the cyanide to dissipate as a gas, um, and they have to be crushed. So, um, I mean, and you know, probably a few dried pits um, that haven't been crushed, it's not going to hurt you, probably. <laughs> Um, but but uh, so so they actually tested the levels of cyanide in a in a pit in a patty a choke cherry patty and it was pretty weirdly ridiculously high in cyanide fresh um, but after drying there was none left so uh, do uh, Lakota or other indigenous peoples in uh, the region have a tradition of making blood sausage. Um, so that's a really interesting question, and the answer to that is is yes. Um, uh, I cannot remember who told me that, but um, maybe it might have been Gladys Hawk, who is this this beautiful beautiful elder from the community of Wakpala on Standing Rock. I think it was her, and she told me that they would actually take the intestines, um, just like you know, just like people make traditional sausage these days, and they would. Um, fill it with organ meats, so things like liver and um, kidney and lung. Uh, to they would stuff it in there and they would boil it and basically make sort of a um, an organ meat sausage out of it. That's, that sounds like a phenomenal vitamin. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I would love the flavor or not. I'm not huge on organ meats. I mean, I'll eat anything, but um, but yeah. <laughs> Somebody's asking about your amazing t-shirt. Where'd you get it? Oh, oh gosh. Uh, so I should totally put a, um, this is from B Yellowtail. B, the letter B dot Yellowtail. She's um, an indigenous uh, fashion 
clothing designer. Um, I, I, I'm not all that into fashion, so I can't remember like if there's another nice term for that. But yeah, I love this shirt and um, it's sold on her website. Do you know if anyone has studied about the cyanide in elderberries being dispersed in the same way as the choke cherries by being crushed? So um, there's been a lot of discussion about elderberries lately, and I'm actually not sure that there are cyanogenic compounds, if that's the concern, um, as far as toxicity in elderberries. But I, I have to tell you, and, and I don't want to like burst anyone's bubble or upset anyone, but um, indigenous people, like I eat elderberry pie all the time. There's nothing in the seeds that I have ever had an issue with. Now, mind you, those are cooked, but I eat raw elderberries as well by the handful. They're delicious. <laughs> um, but yeah, dried and um, cooked elderberries, I've eaten lots of those. Um, my, I have friends who are Amish up in Pennsylvania and they make elderberry pie every year and it's delicious. And, you know, so, but also um, I, I don't know um, where the idea, so, so Okay, it's like I was talking about earlier, if you look in field guides, oftentimes um, you'll see choke cherries listed as poisonous, as toxic. It goes the same with milkweed. How many of you out there have been told that milkweed is toxic once it gets older? Um, and Kier, you probably, I mean, you guys eat a lot of milkweed soup. It never gets toxic. You can, I, I was harvesting milkweed in mid-October this year, um, the, the leaves up at the top, because they're, they're delicious, you know? You can eat them anytime. Uh, so I don't know where the rumor or that weird thing about milkweed being toxic comes from. The same thing goes for elderberries. Um, elderberry tea made from the leaves has been used for thousands of years as an antiviral, um, as an antiviral tea. And now you are told to absolutely remove all the stems, remove all the leaves, make sure you don't consume any of them because they're poisonous and, and even called deadly. You know, I've even seen them called deadly poisonous. And I, you know, I just think that's so interesting because cultures all over the world have been using the leaves as an antiviral and, and have actually found that, um, the leaves have more antiviral uh, compounds than the berries. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right, the questions keep mounting here. Let's see, I'm gonna keep, keep rolling. Sorry. Um, oh, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful discussion. Have you uh, done any fish seafood or seafood fermentation? How, how do you, uh, let's see, how, how to do this in a natural way versus buying at the store? So um, some of you guys know me and my mom is actually half Korean and half Mongolian. So seafood has been an, a part of my life, my whole life. And my mom has actually fermented fish before with just seawater, like with ocean water back when we could still use ocean water and it didn't have microplastics <laughs> all up in it. Um, uh, so the answer is is yes, um, and it is possible. And of course, you know, we've all heard of pickled herring and things like that. So you can pickle fish as well, but that's not the same as fermentation with just salt. Um, from what I understand from my mother is it's a delicate process because there's a fine line, right? How, how many of you out there eat kimchi and think, it's rotten cabbage versus me who thinks kimchi is freaking amazing, you know? Um, so I do, you know, cause I have friends who like, is like, oh gosh, are you eating more of that rotten cabbage? I can't, <laughs> can't believe the smell. And apparently it's a very fine line with the fish as well, a fine line between spoilage and fermentation. So, um, and, and I, I know because I've um, actually wanted to try it. I've looked up methods and things like that online and, um, uh, there is information for doing that online. Thank you. Do you know of cash systems or designs that were intended to last multiple seasons or years? I personally don't, but um, I, I will tell you that that it must be a thing, right? Because um, they've actually found caches that were a hundred years old, and many of them were still intact. Um, and it's it it has all, everything to do with the structural integrity of the cache, but also the plants that were put in there to prevent um, critters from getting in there and eating it. So my uh, great colleague, uh, Tikan up in Alaska, just wanted to let the audience know that uh, 
tuna is cactus fruit in Spanish. So maybe that's, it wasn't <laughs> my interpretation. Oh, tuna oh fish. to make patties out of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Um, I've just always heard them called nopal fruit or um, uh, cactus fruit. Uh, yes, though, I, I have to say that I have actually seen dried um, tuna. Is it, is T U N A? Okay. Um, <laughs> I totally thought they were referring to the fish. But um, <laughs> I've seen uh, dried patties made out of nopal fruit before. So that's wonderful. I read that there are toxins in the European elderberry, but not in the American varieties of elderberry. I was worried after eating fresh elderberries, but I was fine. <laughs> so I guess it's <laughs> more of a statement there. But yeah, okay. directly interesting. Yeah, your point. Yeah. Um, someone uh, wants to make the comment, um, fully agree, you're amazing and thank you for all the important work you do in the world. Uh, thank you for your presentation and knowledge shared. Um, in our Navajo culture, uh, we make blood sausage. We use the blood from the goat or lamb, add cornmeal, use the stomach to fill and then, and then boil. Uh, we have also added potatoes and green chili. So that was a, more of a comment. Yum. That got us through that big giant list and um, <laughs> we still got a little time to spare, so that was great. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. And um, also, you know, people can contact me if they're, you know, if they have any more questions, feel free to find me on Facebook and send a question off to me as well. Great. Um, let's see, Tcon, anything else coming through? this point. Looks like that's about it. Well, again, I just want to appreciate you and, and thank you so much for your time and effort. And, you know, yeah, just the, from the participation, in the uh, question se uh, section and all that, I mean, I think people got so much out of this and, you know, we're just really appreciative of your time and effort. Oh, one more comment came in. Thank you so much on your answer uh, regarding seafood fermentation. Um, this person also absolutely loves kimchi. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, a great end note there. Um, oh, uh, looks like one more coming in. Uh, can you air dry fish? So it's similar, I guess, to what was being talked about before, but maybe it wasn't all captured. Um, so yeah, have you, have you run into any air dry uh, techniques? Absolutely, particularly small fish like anchovies are. Now, um, I don't know that I've seen that here. I've seen um, fish air dried up north. And, I mean, just basically fish jerky. But um, they've every time I've ever seen a fish that's been air dried, it's been an ocean fish uh, that you know, um, and and they used salt water, ocean water to. To help with the drying process. So I, I've never seen um, fish air dried uh, like river fish. Great. All righty. Well, uh, I think that's all that have come through. I just want to appreciate my colleagues, uh, T Khan up in Alaska, Becky Standing Bear from Montana, uh, who've been helping to support the session on the back end and Again, Linda, thank you so much. And we really appreciate all your participation with us over the years as well. And um, yeah, I just want to also uh, make sure that people are targeting all the great sessions to come uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've got 20 some odd more to, to choose from uh, tomorrow. And we really appreciate uh, all the participation across the country. And again, uh, thank you so much, Linda. It's been thank so Thank you guys. Thanks to Khan and Becky and Kier. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, everybody have a good rest of your day and we look forward to convening more.